You wanted to raise the point of the international interest in the region, or was it international reaction to the region? Well, I think it's more accurate to say the international non-reaction, because every time there is a cycle of violence, the international community focuses on what is happening, uh, you know, words of concern, condemnation and so on. But as soon as the violence subsides, everyone's gone to other places around the world where fires is, are burning. Yes. And, and the situation remains the same until the next cycle of violence goes on because there is no solution at hand and the international community has to pay or play a much stronger role in helping or forcing the sides or incentivizing the sides into more, you know, what would be painful uh, concessions, but still important ones. In the long term, meeting the competing needs of the Palestinians and the Israelis is the most <laughs> complex challenge, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Israel for a long time has tried to uh, assert its uh, forceful powers in order to meet its uh, uh, security needs, but at the expense of the needs of the Palestinian people, and that is not sustainable long term. So there has to be some shift and find a way to meet the uh, needs of both people for a sustainable peace uh, between the two people, otherwise it, it wouldn't work. But what is stopping meeting the needs? You know, you've got security on one hand, you have a, a freedom, I guess, on the other. Why are they not being met? I think potentially most needs of both people are quite compatible, but on both sides you have the extreme elements which want more, which is, you know, the radical uh, Jews on one side and the radical Islamists on the other, and a solution would have to uh, involve the main people on both sides saying this is enough. We have to take care of our own without expecting to get everything in return. It might be early in the piece to be asking this question, but right now, is there any hope of peace? Well, there was no hope for peace in the short and medium term before uh, this last weekend's events. But my feeling is that uh, the hope for peace has deteriorated significantly since. You speak to both sides, Gazans and Israelis, and they say they want to live in peace. It seems like that that choice is completely out of their hands. In the foreseeable future, uh, certainly, uh, peace will depend on a great level of trust between the sides. And that trust has been shattered and I don't know how long it will take to rebuild it because every time a cycle of violence goes on, it goes further back. Do you expect this war, as it is now being described, to be limited to Israel and Palestine or Gaza and the Israeli territories? Well, there's a lot of uh, international forces that are working behind the scenes and, uh, and uh, presently in the area to try and prevent that. The Americans have sent uh, warships and, and aircraft carriers to make sure that uh, this does not happen. And there is a lot of uh, work being done by Western powers, by, by Arab states to try and prevent that. So uh, hopefully that will not happen. Israel has mobilized uh, up to, in, in two weeks time, they'll have half a million soldiers that will not only be, or most of them actually, will not be uh, around Gaza, but in other parts, in the north and, and uh, around uh, the West Bank, to try and ensure that this does not happen. So hopefully, uh, no one knows, but hopefully this will be enough to deter escalation. When you look at the role of other players in this, in the lead up to the attacks, what role do you believe Iran played and what role do you believe it will play into the future? And included in that is Lebanon with Hezbollah. Well, there's a lot of uh, debate going on at the moment about the role that Iran had played uh, with some conflicting uh, information, but certainly Iran is a major backer of Hamas, has had some something to do. Uh, what it was, I'm not sure, but Hamas couldn't have pulled it off without at least Iranian knowledge, if not help. So uh, how will that uh, evolve is very difficult uh, to know, but uh, certainly uh, Iran uh, creates a, a major issue for stabi st stabilization of the situation at the moment. The threat of another front, if you like, with Hezbollah, how real is that? 
again, we're speculating here, but uh, Hezbollah is, uh, uh, being the major power in Lebanon, is still beholden to the Lebanese people. And Lebanon is in such a worse or, or such a terrible economic situation that uh, a full-scale war against Israel will be impossible to handle. And so my hope is that uh, this will play a major role in Hezbollah's uh, calculations. Meaning that they'll stay out of it? Hard to predict, but uh, my sense is that uh, together with the presence of the Americans uh, at Lebanon's shore, uh, that they will stay out of it. But again, uh, they are also, and Iran is uh, beholden to some extent to the Hamas, and if Hamas is about to be decimated, if there is a ground assault, then it's very difficult to know. At the moment, there is uh, uh, exchanges of fire between Hezbollah in South Lebanon and Israel, but they are both kind of uh, making sure it doesn't go uh, get out of uh, hand. So whether that will continue, very hard to know. What was the ambition of Hamas by, by breaching security, by making these assaults and these attacks on civilians? What were they hoping to do? Again, we, we can point to a few key factors. Uh, what other factors existed, uh, it's hard to know at this early point, but certainly uh, the abduction of Israeli citizens has been a, a key uh, factor and a key uh, a reason for previous uh, uh, Hamas incursions into Israel. The idea is to try and, uh, and exchange prisoners. There's thousands of uh, Hamas and other Palestinian militants in Israeli uh, prisons at the moment. And uh, in the past, in 2011, for example, one Israeli soldier was exchanged for a thousand Hamas and other organizations militants. And so this idea is very important for Hamas. Uh, the current head of Hamas in Gaza was spent 22 years in Israeli prison and was exchanged as part of those thousand Hamas militants that were taken back. So do you think that was the primary reason for this? Uh a hostage grab? I think that it was a key. I think there are other factors that were in play. For example, uh, this power struggle about the future of the West Bank between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. Hamas, every time Hamas attacks, it, it gets uh, more support among the Palestinian population. There's also an uh, indication that uh, thwarting the uh, ne ongoing negotiations between the US and Saudi Arabia, which includes normalization pact between uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, would have been a key factor because it's against Iran Iranian interests. And so Hamas as a backer of Iran uh, would have also taken that into account. Surely they expected the retaliation they're now receiving. They, they must have known that Israel would fight back. Yes, and that was the reason for the intelligence failure, because the calculations were Hamas is not interested in escalation, knowing what the price will be for the people of Gaza and, and for itself, and that's, that's behind the failure. Uh, if we calculate the number of factors that we can now see that may have led Hamas into that decision, then uh, the price they were willing to pay was on the back of the civilian population of Gaza as in the past. So they're happy to sacrifice their own people? I don't know if happy is the term terminology, but prepared, yes. They describe it as an act of self-defence, not an act of terrorism, the attack on Israel on October 7th. How would you describe it? Well, I think uh, in such a heated conflict, uh, we need to uh, look at international law, and there is a big difference between fighting Israeli soldiers, for example, which is part of, which is okay, so-called okay, uh, by international law, and the targeting and the intentional targeting of civilians, uh, especially uh, what we've seen with mass atrocities, killing families, children, and so on, which is. I would say even goes beyond war crimes, maybe even crimes against humanity, because we're talking about mass atrocities. And this is certainly uh, something that, uh, you know, w will take back the struggle for uh, a Palestinian state, I think, years back.
So right now they're losing the PR war, you think? I think for the time being, yes, uh, especially uh, given the, uh, the uh, media coverage of, of the situation. What will happen longer time will depend on the results of the Gaza siege. If uh, the more casualties among the civilian population of Gaza uh, take place, the harder it will be for backers of Israel in the international community to support uh, these actions. Israel is so wounded and so angry, so hurt. Uh, do you think they care how the world looks upon how they treat Gaza? I think they do. I think, as you, you're rightly pointing out, uh, there's, a, there's been a huge trauma. The entire Israeli uh, public is behind very strong and aggressive action. But at the same time, Israel does need the support, first of all, and mostly of the Americans, which have already pointed to international law as a, as a means to regulate what is taking place next. But also the uh, international public opinion does matter and does count. Whether that will be the overriding factor in the decision making, it's hard to say, but certainly one of the many factors that they're juggling at the moment. You would imagine that right now Israel feels a, a need to flex its muscles to show that it might be wounded but not dead, not broken completely, that it is still a strength despite the breach of its security. How big a factor is that in what happens next, that it must do something? Again, speculating, but for me, I think it will be the most important factor because Israel has now been uh, for decades living on this uh, ability to deter future uh, violence and future incursions from different so-called enemies around, uh, around the Middle East. And without that deterrence, uh, there will be no sense of security, no sense of safety uh, with which the Israeli public uh, cannot uh, live. So this will be uh, the most important factor, I think, in the decision making. But does it still have the capability to provide that security to its people and to flex its muscles in the region? Look, I think, again, that will depend on the outcome of the uh, whether Israel is able to so-called destroy the Hamas uh, and what will be the consequences, what will be the, uh, the uh, end game, uh, the suffering of the Palestinian civilian population in Gaza. I think Israel was surprised, the, uh, the huge failure by the uh, Israeli intelligence. But when you look at the outcome on the ground, yes, a thousand uh, Israelis, civilians were killed in inhumane barbaric acts. But uh, I think they've counted up till now about uh, 180 Israeli soldiers dead and supposedly 1,500 uh, Palestinian militants. So in terms of Israel's capability to defend itself, I think it's still there. Hamas claims that it did not target civilians, that it only targeted soldiers, it only killed soldiers. What do you say to that claim? I think it's a very... Uh, very poor uh, uh, way of looking at things because, uh, based on what I've heard, they say we are not targeting civilians because settlers are not civilians. And then they were asked whether the people living in, uh, in near Gaza, just outside Gaza, which don't live in the West Bank as settlers, in, are, in, are included under settlers, and they didn't have a good answer for that. Is there some semantics where they view that every Israeli is a soldier or will be or has been, because they're all reservists for some stage of their life. Is that how they justify it? It's interesting. It's, a, it's a, an argument that has been raised in the past, but I haven't seen it so far. Uh, it, will, it might come up sooner or later, but uh, it is very difficult to justify the killing of children and, and old people, even if you talk about reservists. And, and women and whole families. So uh, maybe that's why they're still waiting without uh, argument, but certainly doesn't hold water. There has been, uh, in some quarters, great sympathy for the Palestinian cause. The way Palestinians have been treated by the Israeli government. Do you believe there's any justification for the action that we've seen in this past week? I think this is an important point to make. Uh, I myself have long supported uh, the right of the Palestinians for, for a Palestinian state. But, but what is happening is that uh, we have the bandwagon and on the bandwagon we have 
uh, some extreme elements such as Hamas jumping on and the uh, tendency among you know more so-called uh, sane people on that bandwagon has been to uh, be quiet instead of pointing out that this is really not the right way to fight for the liberation of Palestine through violence against civilian. There is that uh, thinking, I think, that if you denounce other people on the bandwagon, as in the use of, of uh, violence against civilians, then you are playing into the hands of Israel and undermining the struggle for a free Palestine. And for me, this is exactly the opposite, because I think that the best service that we can do for the Palestinian people and for the Israeli people is to stop the occupation, but stop the occupation in a way that will have a future for two Palestinian, uh, Palestinian state and an Israeli state living next to one another. It's one thing to have Hamas 70 kilometers away from Tel Aviv and to trust that maybe future arrangement will be made to prevent such violence and to have a Hamas controlling the West Bank 10 kilometers from Tel Aviv. After what had happened, I don't see how the Israeli public that is essential for deciding on a Palestinian state will be willing to take such a risk. This is why I mean that the cause for a free Palestine had gone miles and miles backwards. Yeah, both in, in, in terms of policy and public opinion. Yes. Do you think that Hamas will be wiped out? I mean, that's the Israelis' stated intention, that they wouldn't want to take away their military power and their political power. Will they be successful? It's very difficult or impossible to wipe out ideologies. Yes, Israel can, you know, deal a, a very, very uh, strong blow on Hamas capabilities if they go uh, into a ground assault, they can, uh, you know, kill a lot and obviously a lot of the civilian population as well and a lot of Israelis uh, would die. But uh, as long as there is uh, no solution to the Israel-Palestine issue, then that ideology sooner or later will uh, pop up. So uh, uh, there's no military solution on either side for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It has to be political. Do you think Benjamin Netanyahu can survive this? No, by no means. Uh, there's strong indication that uh, under his leadership, uh, Hamas was allowed to grow. Uh, and uh, alongside all the failures that this government, this most radical government in Israel's history had uh, uh, gone through, including in terms of focusing on the most trivial things instead of focusing on others, then uh, I'd, after, once the war is over, he, he will be ousted. Um, it might be too simple to, to put it in this way, but it's quite ironic, isn't it, that somebody who is such a hawk on security will most likely end his political career because of the failures of his security? Uh, I think you can't really disengage or, 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 or differentiate between the security failure, the political failure in, in other areas. And, and yes, this was a combination of all of these.